Greetings, and welcome back to Gripping Horror. Today, we'll dive into a story about a very experienced and responsible diver, known among his friends for his exceptional meticulousness. But, as seen many times before in cave diving, experience does not equate to flawlessness. This is James Edward Miller's story. Colonel James Edward Miller was born on the 23rd of October, 1960. Straight from childhood, James was an overachiever, the habit that stuck with him all through his adult life. James attended and graduated from Arkansas Technical University in Russellville, Arkansas, where he earned a bachelor's degree in computer science. Following his time at university, James enlisted in the U.S. Army and U.S. Army Reserves, where he served for 31 years attaining the rank of colonel. Most notably, James served in Operation Desert Storm during his military career. You must be wondering what life looked like for James, away from all the action. Well, in his free time, he was an avid cave diver and outdoorsman. He eventually became a well-respected member of the cave diving community, joining the WKPP as a support diver in 2002. The Woodville Cast Plane Project is a project and organization that maps the underwater cave systems underlying the Woodville Cast Plane. Truly the Beethoven of diving organizations, WKPP divers hold every deep distance record in underwater caving. The Woodville Cast Plane Project is also responsible for exploring and mapping more cave passageways below 190 feet than any other organization in the world. As time passed, James, formerly a support diver, became a senior team explorer for WKPP, doing serious setup and exploration dives. Years went by, and James continued to do what he loved, exploring and mapping unknown underwater cave systems, until one fateful exploration. On Saturday, June 11th, 2011, James and the Woodville Cast Plane Dive Team arrived at Whiskey Steel Sink, located on a private property at 127 River Sink Road. By now, James was considered an expert diver with more than 20 years of dive experience accumulated. James and the WKPP Dive Team had been working for many months exploring and mapping caves in the Crawfordville region. Diving a series of sinkholes and caves that connect to the Wukula Springs. Up next in the dive plan was an underwater cave called Whiskey Steel Sink. Unfortunately, neither James nor the dive team could have possibly been prepared for the horrors that were about to unfold here, especially since James had already dived in Whiskey Steel Sink many times before without problem. Not to mention he completed a 12,000-foot setup in Wukula only a few weeks prior. Whiskey Still Sink is located in a coastal woodland of the Warner Boyce State Park in Pasco County, Florida. The spring pool is situated about 200 yards north of the entrance to a dirt road heading north of Salt Springs Road behind the Gull View Square Mall. Admittedly, many divers know about Whiskey Spring but have not explored it. Firstly, due to its remote location on private land, and secondly, WKPP is the only organization currently allowed to dive Whiskey Spring due to the extreme nature of the system and the discipline required to safely explore it. This is a controversial issue, as many people think Whiskey Spring should be open to the public, or at the least, to other qualified cave diving groups and individuals. Peering down into the 164 foot deep shaft, of brownish-black liquid. With James in the lead, along with two buddy divers following, they begin the descent into Whiskey Sink at 2 p.m. From Whiskey Sink, the conduit proceeds at a shallow depth to Innisfree Sink. Then, beyond Innisfree, it drops deeper to a maximum depth of around 225 feet, or 69 meters, and continues down. Thus, their decompression stops were to be done on the other side of Inners Free. 
A decompression stop is a pause in a diver's ascent, made to allow the body to expel dissolved gases, primarily nitrogen in the blood, that was absorbed by the diver during the dive. Without decompression stops, these gases would expand, turning into bubbles, causing decompression sickness. The spinal cord and brain are usually affected, causing numbness, paralysis, impaired coordination, and in the worst cases, death. While recreational divers must be aware of their ascent rate and perform multiple safety stops, for deep divers such as James and the two buddy divers, keeping a slow ascent rate is often not enough to avoid problems. The solution? Stage decompression. Stage decompression is a special type of ascent where a diver stops at various depths for certain amounts of time, breathing stage bottles of different gas blends at each stop point. This accelerates inert gas diffusion and expels the gas out of the diver's body faster. The team's bottom mix was gas blend meant for a depth of 240 feet. They carried along with them decompression gas to be used at 120 feet, 70 feet, and oxygen at 20 feet depth respectively. Given the offset profile of the stops, it is concluded that the team came up with their own decompression setup. Decompression must start downstream of Innisfree as the Innisfree sink becomes shallow before heading back upstream to Whiskey Still Sink. James and the two buddy divers begin making their way towards the shallow cave between Whiskey Sink and Innisfree in Ashy. The team currently using their 120 feet bottles, which was suitable for the shallow depths. As the team continue passing Innisfree, they dropped decompression bottles at their respective depths, 20 feet, 70 feet, 120 feet, and 240 feet. The first fatal error occurred at the 70-foot stop. James dropped one of his 240 feet bottles at this stop, a tank that was needed to survive the deeper sections of the cave. Instead, he should have dropped his 70 bottle, as it should never have been carried any further into the cave. James was the last one to leave the 70 feet stop. As none of them noticed, the team continued proceeding down to the 120 feet stop. The team stopped for their switch to the 240 feet gas mixture, which was their bottom gas, as they were now proceeding into the deeper parts of the cave. At this point, the second and most crucial error occurred. James switched onto his 70 foot bottle, breathing the completely wrong mix of gases for the current depth. Part of the WKPP standard procedure and a very critical step in each and every bottle switch is to check the MOD sticker on the side of the bottle, which would have made it very clear that he was about to switch to the wrong bottle. But for some reason, this check was missed. To make matters worse, the secondary check was also missed. The buddy divers were to watch the bottle switches carefully enough to confirm the correct bottle is in play. But once again, this secondary check was not performed and the error was not caught. So, following the switch, the team dropped their 120 feet bottles and continue on into the cave. A little less than an hour went by. The whole time, James continued to breathe the wrong gas mixture. Shortly after reaching 240 feet, the team turned their dive and began their ascent. With James in the lead, they start swimming back upstream to Innisfree, the group still completely unaware of the horrors that were about to follow. Then, without warning at 222 feet, James began seizing uncontrollably. Complete terror was unleashed. His buddy divers now in complete shock sprung into action, swimming over to James, but unfortunately, the divers were unable to get an oxygen tank of the correct mix into him in time. They tried shaking James out of his incoherent state, but were unsuccessful in their attempts, and James drowned in their arms. After a prolonged exit, the team was able to bring James back to the basin at Innisfree, and shortly thereafter, a pair of WKPP support divers from another cave dive site 
in the Natural Bridge area of Woodville brought him back to the surface. The support divers estimated that James was in the water approximately one hour and 40 minutes. James was pronounced dead at 4.25 p.m. This is a tragic story of a series of unfortunate events that lead to an irreversible ending. There was a significant error, a critical error, plus missed opportunities to catch and correct those errors. James was a very experienced and responsible diver, known among his friends for his exceptional meticulousness. The caving community thought he'd be one of the last people ever imagined to die this way. This dive was well within his skill and experience levels, and the sight was very familiar to him. But for some reason, on this day, his usual attention to detail and by the book orientated nature was negatively affected. Circumstances that would prove fatal. This would not be the first time that a highly trained US military soldier make a small mistake underwater, which would prove fatal. About 11 years prior to James Miller's accident, on the morning of September the 17th, 2000, Air Force Master Sergeant Paul Hayden and his brother start walking into the old horizontal water well, a long mile up remote, little known Goss Canyon, in La Crescenta next to the Angeles National Forest. Paul had grown up in La Crescenta and had gone into the old well, opened in 1907, many times before. He was now a skilled US Air Force para-rescue instructor. On this trip, he intended to go farther than ever before by passing sumps hundreds of feet deep in the old well. About 150 feet in, they encountered water. Hayden anchored a rope at the edge of the water for use as a guideline and prepared to begin his dive. His primary light was a waterproof video camera lamp. He had told his brother that he had two hours of air and to get help if he did not return within that time. However, about 20 minutes later, something went terribly wrong and his brother could no longer move the line. When he did not respond to tugs on the rope, his brother went for help, calling authorities at about 1.20 p.m. He hurried to the nearby La Crescenta Sheriff's Office for assistance. Soon rescue personnel from several agencies using four-wheel drive vehicles to traverse the old, treacherous dirt road arrived outside the well entrance. About 185 feet into the flooded section and over 400 feet from the entrance, rescue diver Mark Lonsdale found Sergeant Paul's body in a long, partially water-filled passage. His head was underwater and the regulator was out of his mouth. His scuba tanks were nearly full. Paul's body was recovered from a one-metre diameter tunnel immediately below a gas pocket. A videotape recovered from his camera indicated that Paul had poked his head into the gas pocket and removed his regulator from his mouth. The camera then recorded a fall to the bottom and no further movement. Mines and wells are inherently more dangerous than caves since there is much more likelihood of collapse and the possible presence of toxic gases and low oxygen levels. Subsequent samples from the airspace showed only 4% oxygen Normal air contains 21% oxygen. Breathing air with 7% or less oxygen will cause the required oxygen supply to the brain to be immediately shut off, a condition known as asphyxia, a condition Paul succumbed to. What makes this story even more unfortunate is that prior to the trip, Paul had agreed with his para-rescue co-workers that he should not remove his regulator, a small mistake he made with fatal results. That's it for today's stories. As seen from James and Paul, no matter the experience level, a minuscule mistake will more than likely lead to fatal consequences in cave diving. May they rest in peace. This has been Gripping Horror, and I hope to see you in the next one.